Hello everyone and welcome back. Today I'm going to walk you through step by step the entire process of building a simple guitar pedal from a kit. I know it's easy to psych yourself out and get to thinking that building an electronic device from scratch is way too complicated of a process for any average person to understand. That's one of the main reasons why I'm here today is to show you that it's not really as difficult as it sounds. So I'm just your average guy. I don't have any electrical engineering degrees. I don't have any formal training doing this stuff. I've just watched a bunch of videos. I've read a bunch of articles. I have a little bit of trial and error experience. And uh, I've only ever built about four guitar pedals successfully. My point being is that if I can figure out how to do it, then I bet that you can too. So I have the classic overdrive kit from Build Your Own Clone which closely emulates the Ibanez TS-9 Tube Screamer. It's a bright and punchy overdrive that enhances the mid-range frequencies and pairs well with fuzz or distortion pedals. Now this is not a sponsored video, although that would be nice, and I am in no way affiliated with the Build Your Own Clone Company. They are simply the company that was most recommended when I went looking for complete guitar pedal build kits. Anyway, there are a few optional mods that you can do to make this circuit sound a little bit different, which are included in the instructions along with the necessary components in the kit. For the sake of this video, I won't be doing any of the mods, we're just building the circuit as it was originally intended. Build Your Own Clone has provided the building instructions in PDF format on their website. There will be a link in the description so you can have a closer look for yourself. A couple months back, I made a video where I demonstrated how to do a hydro dip paint job on a guitar pedal enclosure, and this is in fact the very same pedal that we are working on today. So that's the only step that has already been done prior to this video, and if you'd like to see what I did, again, I've provided a link in the description to the previous video where I paint the pedal enclosure. For the sake of not making an already lengthy video longer than it needs to be, I'm going to assume that you already know how to solder safely and effectively, and you already have the correct soldering equipment. I might do my own video on the subject at some point, but I know someone more qualified has already done it. The information is already out there somewhere, so if, if your soldering skills or knowledge are rusty, please take a minute to prepare yourself, and come back to this video when you're ready. So the first thing we'll need to do is go through the parts list. Some of this may be things you already recognize. The jacks and the switch maybe, maybe the knobs and the potentiometers or the pots. My best advice is to not worry about what all the different little electrical bits do just yet, unless you're particularly curious. This is the part where it's easy to get overwhelmed. But as long as you follow the instructions closely, you don't have to understand everything that's going on here, and your overdrive pedal will still turn out just fine. I'll say this much, it's a lot simpler than it seems. I've found that about 80% of all electronic circuits are composed of three components. Capacitors, resistors, and transistors. Those three components practically make the world go round. They are the backbone of every electronic device. There are certainly plenty of other types of components, but these three are the most common and will exist in some form in nearly every circuit. For now, we just want to make sense of this parts list really quick so we can get onto some soldering. So you really just need to know what each one looks like and then we'll move on. Okay, so we're just reading through the parts list really quick. The first one we'll come across is the resistors, and you'll notice that there are several resistors contained in this kit, all with different values. The different values are denoted by these colored bands on the body of the resistor. Next up after that we have the capacitors. There are three different types of capacitors, and they all look a little bit different, but they're all doing essentially the same job. Now we come to the diodes. There should be three diodes in the kit, and they look just like this. Next up is transistors. There's two transistors. They're the ones that are black, and they have three legs. Now we have our IC chip, which is an op amp, a 4558 op amp to be specific, and we have the 8-pin socket that the IC chip plugs into. We have three potentiometers. One's for level, one's for tone, and one is for drive. We have our pre-drilled and pre-painted enclosure, we have our printed circuit board, our foot switch, 
the knobs that go on top of the pots. We have the AC adapter jack. There's one quarter inch mono jack and one quarter inch stereo jack. Our indicator LED that will light up when the pedal is in operation. We have our nine volt battery snap. We have these four little rubber stick on bumpers that go on the bottom of the pedal. And we have some hookup wire. So the first bit of soldering that we'll do is the diodes. There are only two of them, and they go up here near the top of the board. Make sure that you match the end of the diode with the stripe to the graphic that's printed on the circuit board. The two diodes should both face opposite of each other. Essentially, a diode is sort of a one-way gate for electricity to flow through. But the purpose this serves in the overdrive circuit has more to do with the high and low clipping which is when an audio waveform is flattened out at the peaks, which introduces distortion. So using different types of diodes for the clipping can greatly impact the tone of your distortion or overdrive pedal. You might have noticed this is where we can do one of those optional mods that we talked about earlier, but we're not going to do any of those for the sake of this video. They will all be marked as yellow in the instructions, and I urge you to read it all carefully because you'll be handling each mod a little bit differently whether we're building it to factory specs or whether we're actually installing the mods. This one allows you to add in a third diode for what they call asymmetrical clipping. Or you can just solder in a jumper wire to bypass this option, which is what we're going to do for this video. I made the jumper wire after I soldered in the other diodes and trimmed their leads short, using the discarded lead as a jumper. So next up we'll do the resistors. These can especially be a pain to identify which resistor is which value, and we'll have quite a few particular values to find. The value of a resistor is usually depicted by a series of colored bands, each one with a unique pattern, and these patterns are quite long and hard to remember. For this kit, you can safely assume that the 510K resistors are the only ones packaged as a group of three. The 1K resistors are the only group of 4, and the 10K are the only group of 7. So my board doesn't get too crowded while I solder. I only solder in a few resistors at a time, trim their leads, then add a few more. Maybe other people can do this faster and do it all in one step, but that's just my preference to take my time a little more and leave myself more room to work. You'll also notice that many of these resistors are part of the optional mods that I mentioned earlier. The instructions go into much better detail on the mods and what to do with them. As long as you use the resistor values that are printed on the circuit board, you will be building the pedal to factory specifications with no mods. So this is what your board should look like after all the resistors have been soldered in. Next step is to add the IC socket, just the socket only. It's the piece that came poked into the little pink foam block. The IC chip itself is very sensitive to high heat and static electricity, so this is why we solder in a socket first and plug in the chip later. These leads can be a little harder to solder since they're smaller and closer together. And make sure you orient the socket so the notched end is on the same side as the graphic that is printed on the circuit board. Actually putting the IC chip into the slot will be one of the last steps that we do to avoid overheating the chip while we finish soldering the rest of the board. Next step is the transistors. This is a super simple step. These are the little black components that have three legs and there are only two transistors in the circuit. You'll notice one side of the transistor is rounded and the other side is flat. This is how you will ensure the transistor is oriented in the proper direction and all three pins connect to the right spot. Again, this is printed on the circuit board as well, so you can match up the flat side visually. We'll just solder these in right quick and move on. Next, we're gonna get down to the capacitors. There are quite a few different types of capacitor, which all essentially do the same job, so don't worry about the difference too much right now. There are three types included in this build kit. Electrolytic capacitors, film capacitors, and there's one ceramic disc capacitor. The electrolytic capacitors are the ones that look like tiny batteries. These are the only capacitors that are polarized, which means they have a negative and a positive side. 
The negative side is indicated by the shorter lead on one side, with a stripe printed on the body of the capacitor above it. The positive lead should be soldered to the square-shaped solder pad. This is, of course, the longer of the two leads. The rest of the capacitors are not polarized, and thus they can be installed in any orientation and they will work the same either way. Again, there are a few optional mods that can be done with the capacitors, which we will bypass and continue building the pedal to factory specs. We'll just skip past the soldering by using the power of editing. This is what the board looks like with all the capacitors soldered in. The next quick little step we can do is to solder in the 9 volt battery clip. The two wires go through these little stress relief holes in the board, and then the pre-stripped ends will go through and be soldered on the other side. Black goes to the negative pad, red to the positive. Once they're both soldered in place, carefully pull the wires tight. Now we're at the point where we need to cut and strip some wires. Refer to the instructions manual for the exact measurements that you will need. There is plenty of wire included in the kit in case you mess up and need to redo a few wires, and if for some reason you do run out of wire, you can use any insulated, braided wire of a similar gauge instead. Now everyone has their own preferred way they like to go about stripping the wires. I just use a razor blade, which I happen to steal out of my drywall knife. It's sharp and thin enough that a small amount of pressure will allow it to cut through the insulation of the wire. I'm not super accurate with my measurements, always erring on the side of the wire being too long rather than too short. As I mentioned, there's plenty of wire included. You shouldn't run out if you're just a little liberal with your measurements. Now we'll just strip the ends of the wire about a quarter inch from the ends. Again, I'm not measuring that out super accurately, just eyeballing a quarter inch and going for it. I'll just gently roll the wire across the blade, being very careful not to cut through the wire itself, but just the insulation. Then I'll just pinch the area I cut between my fingernails, give it a little tug, and the insulation should come right off the end. I prefer this to wire stripping pliers. I've never found a pair that really work consistently for me, and do a clean job every time. Whereas the razor blade is effective and reliable, it's just my personal preference. Of course, you want to be very careful of your fingertips if you're going to do it the way that I've demonstrated in this video. I am not responsible for any cuts or any accidental amputations. So now we just need to tin the end of the wires that we just cut, and then the wires will be ready to attach to the circuit board. Tinning is a process where you just melt a little solder on the end of the wire, which makes it easier to solder onto other things afterward. We'll just give the end of each wire a little twist, so there's not a bunch of strands sticking out in random directions, and just put a little dab of solder on the end, making sure we leave it clean with no big lumps of solder remaining. It seems to work a little better if you heat the end of the wire first, rather than melting the solder right onto a cold wire. The solder will have a tendency to flow where you apply the most heat. So five of the wires we just cut will be attached directly to the circuit board. We'll just poke those through from the top and solder them from the bottom. The other three will be used to hook up the DC power jack. So first we will need to solder these onto the three posts on the back of the jack. And then we'll route the wires to their appropriate place on the circuit board and solder those in place as well. Once the jack is hooked up, we will break out our beautiful pre-painted enclosure and start connecting some components inside the box. I've covered the entire process of painting the enclosure in a previous video. Check the description for a link if that's something you're interested in seeing. We'll just mount the DC power jack to the enclosure, poke it through the little hole, and tighten the nut on the other side. Next we'll do the potentiometers, or the POTS as they're called, and the indicator LED. The instructions want you to do this difficult maneuver where you poke the components through first and lower the enclosure over the top. 
Whichever way you do it, make sure you don't solder anything until you have all of the components oriented properly and the circuit board is fit neatly inside of the enclosure. This is a step that I struggled with a lot, so my solution was to tighten the nuts on the pots almost all the way tight so they wouldn't move around as much, but their position would still remain adjustable. Lining up all three pots in the correct orientation will position the entire board the way you need it for soldering. If the pots are lined up right, then the LED should just fall into the right place. If not, then make sure it's sitting properly before soldering. Also, it's important to note that one leg of the LED is longer, and it should go into the square-shaped solder pad. An LED is a diode, and remember from earlier that diodes are directional. There is a positive and a negative side. One more detail. You want to make sure the board is sitting slightly raised up, so the backs of the pots aren't touching anything, potentially causing a short circuit. So we'll just solder these components in place really quick and move on to the next step. Now we'll attach the quarter inch input and output jacks as well as the foot switch, starting out by attaching them to the enclosure. After they are secured and tightened snugly, we'll take the wires we soldered onto the board earlier and poke them through the appropriate contacts on the output and input jack, and just solder those in place. It's a tricky angle and hard to see on my camera, so we'll just use the magic of Hollywood one more time and show the finished result after soldering. The jacks are now done, and next we need to cut a few more wires to connect the foot switch. The details are all there in the instructions. The one interesting thing to note here is we will actually strip one of these wires much longer, about a half inch or so, and this will be used to bridge two of the contacts on the foot switch together. So using the magic of Hollywood just one more time, now all of the wires are ready, ends stripped and tinned, we just need to poke them through these last remaining solder pads and hook them up to the proper contacts on the foot switch. We can poke them through the top and solder them to the bottom of the board, or poke them up from the bottom and solder them to the top of the board. It will function the same either way, so the choice here is really up to you. We need to be careful to follow the instructions exactly and match the right contact on the circuit board to the right lug on the switch. I actually ended up unscrewing the pots and the jacks so I could remove the circuit board from the enclosure slightly. This gives you much easy access for the soldering process. I ran into some trouble with the wire that connects to terminal 8. It ended up being too short to reach the proper contact, so I had to redo that one after I already put the board back inside of the enclosure. Again, I'll reassure you there is plenty of wire included in this kit. It doesn't hurt to make them a little longer than specified if you need to. There's a little jumper that's supposed to connect post 3 and 6 of the switch, so we'll use the cutoff leg from one of our components, just like what we did earlier with the optional diode. Okay, so now we're almost done. Let's just take that IC chip from earlier and just connect it into its socket. There will be a mark on the IC and a mark on the socket, so you can be certain you're connecting it in the proper orientation. The legs are delicate and easy to bend, so line it up carefully before you push down with any force into the socket. So now we'll talk about the purpose of this chip a little bit. This chip is called an IC, which is short for Integrated Circuit. So it literally has a miniature version of an entire circuit inside of this little tiny box. You can think of it like its own independent electronic device, and all the legs are either inputs or outputs. This box will do one specific job in the circuit, you just need to hook it up the right way. Like I said earlier, in our case, this IC chip is what's called an op amp. It's like a tiny audio amplifier inside a little black box. And this chip itself does most of the heavy work in the pedal, as far as making the guitar signal louder, and as far as distorting the signal. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so now you can give yourself a huge high five. All of the soldering is done. And there's just a few more things we need to do to finish up here. Let's screw the back of the enclosure in place now and stick these rubber feet to the bottom if you wish. Before we attach the knobs onto the pots, we'll just plug it in and give it a little test and make sure the pedal works and we don't have to take it all apart again. Okay, so here we are testing with the clean tone first. Then we'll click the pedal on. And we find that everything is working just fine. Testing the drive pot to make sure it gives us more or less distortion. The tone pot gives us a cut or boost and treble. And the volume pot works properly. So this has all been a success, we just need to put the knobs on top of the pots and then tighten them down. You'll need a very small flathead screwdriver in order to tighten the tiny screws that go into the sides of the knobs, or you'll need to find something that's small enough to stick in there and turn the screw. I like to make sure the pots are turned all the way down and install the knobs so they're pointed at about a 7 or 8 o'clock position. It's all just for aesthetics, but the knobs should all be pointed the same way when they're turned all the way up or all the way down. Also, make sure all the other nuts on the jacks, pots, and foot switch are tightened down properly, and you are now finished building your pedal. So congratulations, and if you made it this far, then I hope all that made sense to you. Hopefully you are less overwhelmed rather than more overwhelmed. That was the purpose of this video. And if you didn't really catch everything I said, then there's nothing wrong with coming back to this video later and watching it again or watching it a few times. Definitely feel free to drop me a comment and let me know what you think about this video. If it seems like people are enjoying this or if they want to see more content about soldering or building pedals or other musical gadgets in the future, then I will definitely accommodate that. It's a hobby I really enjoy doing, but I'm not that experienced and I'm not that good at it myself yet. But I think it's kind of neat to make these videos at a beginner level. That way hopefully some of the newcomers to building pedals or building gadgets in general can uh, relate to the level that I'm at and we can kind of learn it together at more of a, the same skill level as each other. I'm thinking maybe that's a better environment for some people to learn than maybe some of the experts who have been doing it for a while and maybe they'll overlook some details that are hard for the newcomers. Anyway, this has gone on long enough. I'd like to thank everybody so much for watching and I'll catch you all in another video. Hope you have fun out there.